Hey, John here. So I just assembled, well, partially assembled uh, a board from this project number 2067, which is this thing right here. It's a CPU board with a connector on this end that's intended to be plugged into an FPGA breakout board that I designed some years ago, 2057, which looks like this. So that CPU board plugs into this connector right here. The last time I soldered on the CPU and this connector and some bypass caps. I did not yet put on the SRAM because I want to see proof of life out of the CPU before I solder in risk wasting an SRAM. So let's just dive right in, get some Verilog code put together and exercise some of these pins and see what happens. Thank you, thank you to all my patrons, all my patrons, especially the VIPs shown here. You help out buy some of these parts, especially when I screw up and I gotta start over. <laughs> thank you very much. I just noticed in this repo, I don't have any links in here to things like the manual for the, the Z8 S180, and I should probably do that. I'm gonna find some reliable uh locations where they may be hosted so i can link to them so you can follow along in that regard okay now in this repo there's a fpga directory that you can see has been recently messed with in here is where we're going to be playing around today so this is the directory on my raspberry pi where i cloned that particular repo and here's the fpga directory i'll put links to the various github repos and stuff below the video as well so that you can figure out where this stuff comes from. So, all right, so this tree of files is a verbatim copy. I just copied the Verilog examples, okay? In here, a bunch of example programs and stuff for another series I'm putting together on how to write Verilog programs, which you may want to uh, peruse. I'll be releasing these over the course of time while playing around with the Z8S180 board and writing some test programs. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to kind of figure along as we go. I'm jumping a little ahead of the um, of the Verilog uh, video series at the moment uh, because I'm just too excited. I got to test out my CPU card, but all this will come together in good time. Anyway, my point here is that I've copied these make files and these various rules. I talk about this at great length in the video series for these Verilog examples. Again, I'll put more links to the other repos and this one on my um, description on the YouTube. Down here, there's probably a link in here to another playlist on YouTube. I'm embarrassed to see that it's not way to advertise yourself. <laughs> wow. Uh, I will have to put a link in here to the other playlist on YouTube where I do talk about um, Verilog, and this is the website where all I'm putting all my example programs for that series. Okay, so I will add links to the description below this one. In any event, this is the repo, Verilog examples. I just copied all the files into this FPGA directory right here in the Project 2067 repo. Deleted everything I didn't need, which was most of it, but I got the main structure and it's the same as I go through in that other uh, video playlist, okay? Specifically the make rules, the make file, and the make 2057 rules. And this all has to do with uh, what, what FPGA do you have, what, you know, what's the device, the package, and how do you program it and stuff like that. Okay, so I then proceeded to make some other minor differences. Notice that the PCF file is in the same directory as the make file in this set of code, right? Now, in the other repo, I had different PCF files for each one of the examples that I was playing around with. And the reason I did that was because it has, uh, it, it's something that you should get used to understanding how that all works, especially when you change FPGAs and stuff like that. In this particular case, all these programs are designed for one specific FPGA on one specific board, and that's the 2057 board. And this is what the PCF file for that looks like. 
It looks like a bit of a mess because I have to fix the tabs in there. I suspect would be a good idea. Maybe I'll try and do that and do a white space update in the repo. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into a little bit of detail about these pull-up resistors today. They don't work the way I thought they did uh, in some cases. But I would argue the PCF file is still okay as it is with the pull-ups in here. And what I'm referring to specifically is on Yosis, the pull-up resistors, we have to use the explicit uh, method of specifying the pull-ups by using the SBIO uh, modules in order to make sure they work the way we want them to. And right now, there's only one set of pins that I configure that way, and we'll see that soon enough. But I do turn on all the pull-ups on the address bus, in a lot of these things. The data bus has them on, but as we will see, if you use Yosis to compile this code, this will not be enough to make sure that those pull-ups are actually engaged. The rest of these are uh, either we don't really care or they will work fine. Uh, what you'll see is these data lines are in-out pins, and that's why there's something wonky going on with these pull-ups. If they're just simply inputs, like the address bus, the pull-ups will work fine. Uh, okay, so what else have we got? These are You recognize these are all the pins from the Z8 S180. Uh, these are the same as the Z80. And it has a built-in DMA controller, and it has some extra uh, pins beyond the Z80 to deal with some extra uh, features that the Z8S180 has. The interrupt inputs, the non-maskable interrupt, memory request, I.O. request, read, write. I went over this at great length when I was designing my Z80 retro board. These pins, if you need help, you can have a look-see at that playlist where I talk about what I'm doing with all those pins. M1, Phi, refresh, and so on. These pins are also all connected to the FPGA. Down here we have the reset pin that resets the CPU. And these three pins control the SRAM that I have not yet soldered on my board, by the way. Uh, the reason for that is I don't want to waste it till I know the uh, rest of the board works. Okay, so this is the main oscillator that comes into the FPGA. I talked about that when I talked about the Project 2057, which is the FPGA breakout board that I showed you a second ago. These are the LEDs on the FPGA board. And these are the switch, the press buttons, the push buttons on the FPGA board. And I also just created a bunch of test points, TP0 through 15, the 16 test point pins on the bottom row of the FPGA uh, because I found it very annoying and difficult to get my scope uh, probes clipped onto the pins for the CPU board. So what you'll see I'm doing in here is I'm going to go ahead and just connect through the FPGA. I'm going to just go ahead and say, hey, I want to see the M1 and the Phi and some other pins, I don't want to be able to put, clip my probes on there. So I'm going to just connect them through the FPGA to the other connector on the other side of the eval board, the breakout board, so that I can see what the heck's going on and clip my scope probes on there. All right? So that's what all those TP thingies are. And again, the interesting thing here, in contrast to the Verilog examples, I put the PCF file up here. I'm going to have only one. I'm not going to have one for every example program. So the first thing I want to do is my no-op test. So I, for all I know, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? How do I know until I see the thing do something? So the simplest thing I can think of doing is connecting the data bus up to all binary zeros and just let her fly is if the CPU reads the memory, it gets all zeros. And in a zero, on a Z80, a zero is a no-op. So in the readme file for this particular uh, FPGA application, I got a little note in here, send zero to ZPU every time it wants to read anything. If it reads anything and it gets a zero, if, it, if it's fetching an instruction, it'll do a no-op. What'll happen there? Well, it'll go then fetch another one, and then it'll fetch another one and so on. And I want you to do this in a loop 
so to speak. Uh, I mean, the CPU just fetches an instruction, execute the instruction, fetch the instruction, execute. So what does that really then mean we're going to see on the bus, right? Well, what will happen is the address bus will first have a zero on it. Well, it fetches the byte at address zero because the Z80, when you boot it, and I assume the Z8S180 does the same thing, and it just starts reading from address zero to get an instruction. What is it going to do? Nothing. When, after that, it'll increment the address and then fetch another uh, instruction at address one. Do nothing. Fetch the one at address two. Do nothing. So what this should result in is we should see the CPU fetching something from address zero, then one, two, three, four, five. So we should see the address bus counting. And that's all we have to, you know, that's, that's the whole point of this test. All right, so what am I going to do here? If we look closely, let me do a make clean here. All I have is a top.v and a make file to make it into a, you know, the binary that we're going to put in the FPGA. I don't have a test case. Why do I not have a test case? Well, I'm too excited and didn't want to make one. But if we look at this program, it turns out this doesn't really do it. Now think about it. <laughs> what do you have to do here? I have to give it a zero. <laughs> There's not much to test here. So I'm going to just wing it and see what happens. So what do we got here? The ports for this top-level module, the only one in this design, are going to be most every one that you just saw on the PCF file. The only thing interesting about this is this one right here, the data bus, is declared as an in-out. And because this word looks so much like input, and it's so easy to overlook this subtle thing going on here, I added this comment over here because I, this is just really a bad, it's a it's an all right name, and this is an all right name, but they look so close to the same. It's I, my eyes, I can't see that so well. So I, I wanna yell around and scream and wave my hands everywhere so that no one misses this subtlety, okay? Because this will become an issue as we move forward. Uh, okay, what do we got going on here? We got the hardware clock. This is our oscillator running at 25 megahertz. We have one of the two press button switches coming in here. The LEDs are outputs from the perspective of the FPGA, and we're going to light them up to put test patterns on there and see what's going on. Specifically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the address uh, bits from the, uh, from the CPU. I'm going to route them over to the LEDs so I can see it counting on those LEDs. Uh, there's the address bus that comes in. The data is both directions. Right now, we're only going to just bring it. Uh, we're going to use it as an output because we're not going to read anything out of the CPU. But what we really want to do is not drive any data onto the data bus unless the CPU really wants to see it. Because if we're driving it at the same time the CPU, then we have a bus conflict and it could be a, a problem. Uh, I don't think it's a big deal, uh, honestly, for a little while to have a bit of a bus conflict. But let's start out right and keep moving forward. So this is the only real wonky thing going on here, is we're going to run that bidirectionally. What else we got? Almost every feature of the CPU, shut it all off. We don't want a bus request. We don't want interrupts. We don't want non-maskable. We don't want a DMA. We don't want anything. Just let it go, okay? So I'm going to tie all these pins that are outputs from the FPGA to the CPU. I'm going to just tie them off and say disable, 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 disable. That's what the code is going to do below here, all right? And the, uh, the memory, we don't even care. It's not even soldered on the board. So who cares what I do with those pins? Uh, we are going to have to reset the CPU. We are going to have to give it a clock, which is this EXT clock here. Otherwise, the CPU won't go. CPU will divide the clock in two by default. At some point, we'll probably look more closely at a lot of the specs and stuff for the Z8S180, but I'll just tell you right now. By default, out of power up, out of reset, the chip will take this frequency here, divide it by two, call that phi, and that signal will be the master clock of the CPU. So I'm going to give it 12 and a half megahertz in this test case. Okay, it's then going to run at six and a quarter because that's what it's going to do. Okay, all right. What else is going to happen? I got to reset it somehow. And what I'm going to do for reset is I'm going to tie that to one, that that this 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 push button up here. 
I'm going to just connect that push button up to the reset. You press the push, and it resets the CPU. Not a problem. Okay, now it's a noisy reset. There's no timing. There's no debouncing. This is just a hack, okay? Just to do a quick check. Does it work? Can it work? If it fails, then I'll start cleaning up the code and try and figure out why. But if it works good enough for now, that's my goal. And I have reason to believe it'll be okay. So what else we got? A bunch of status signals here we can look at uh, while the thing is running. We'll see if it's doing something interesting. Is the oscillator coming off of the FPGA board? LEDs. Uh, I guess I got both of these. What? S1. Wow. That's very interesting. I declared this twice, and it did not complain. That is weirdo. I did not. I didn't notice that. That is strange. So I'm gonna, wow, and the LEDs are in there twice as well. That is just and so is the clock for crying out loud. All this is in there twice. Uh, and comments below is this a feature of Vera Long to say that's okay? Wowie, wow, wow. That is weirdo. Okay. Well, let's get rid of these spare ones. I don't even use S2, so we can get rid of that as well. Those are the test point pins. Here are how we are going to use the test point pins. Now, uh, what do we got? 15 down to zero for the test points. Now, I've chosen the pins on the bottom connector. Unfortunately, this is in reverse order. I may, uh, I apologize. This is going to be the far left pin moving to the right as we go. So bear that in mind. That's just how I encoded this. I apologize. So here's me. The, so the reset signal will equal whatever comes out of the switch. Remember, the switch goes to, to ground when you press it, and it floats up high when you release it. And that's what we want for the reset. The subscript N is the uh, my note in, in, in Verilog to tell me that these are should have a bar over it. They're active low. Half the time when I read one of these variables, I hear Wayne's world in the back of my head going, reset, not. <laughs> so that's how that works. Uh, here is the tri-state bus that's both input and output. So depending on whether I write a, a value or a Z into the data bus, that will determine whether or not the bus is actually going to drive data back to the CPU or not. So let's look at this expression right here. I'm going to add some gratuitous parentheses so that it's more obvious what's going on here, which is this. Uh, so I'm gonna say D, remember that's the 8-bit data bus up here. It's an in out. So I will say that if read is low, which means you know the CPU wants to read something. Now I don't have MREC in there or anything else, just if read is asserted, then this is what the value of this expression will be, which is eight bits of zeros. There's my no op. If the read signal is not low, I want to disconnect myself from the data bus. So there's my high impedance. It's like you do this type of thing in Verilog so that the compiler can infer your intentions, okay? Now we'll see a warning come out of Yosis that says that, you know, Yosis has very uh, preliminary support for tri-stated buses right now and uh, therefore this will generate a warning but it will do the right thing as we expect uh, because I've done this before <laughs> with Yosis so it will be okay now I got some playing around fun and games down here that I copied from the blinky test program our clock that comes in off the board is running at 25 megahertz and what we want to do is not run the uh, the Z80 too fast. And in this first test, I want to run it at human speed because I want to watch the addresses count on those LEDs. So I played around a little bit with some different ideas for timing. And I threw up, you know, the fact that the, 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 the crystal 
our the oscillator on the FPGA is running at 25 megahertz. If we divide it by uh, 16 million, which would be if I said I want a 24-bit counter in there, if you overflow 2 to the 24th power, every time you overflow that counter, you would be dividing this by 16 million. And if you did that, we end up with about, well, how does that work? If I'm running it, this divided by 16 million is not, oh yeah, well, eh, <laughs> yeah, maybe one and a half hertz, a little bit faster, okay, uh, if you make that division. And that would be if you have 24-bit wide counter. If we only have 22-bit wide counter, it'll go a little bit faster. And that is actually what we want, as we'll see when we look at the waveforms coming out of the Z8S 180. Why? Because the main clock, remember, inside the S180 is divided by 2. And then, in order to do an instruction cycle, as we saw while playing around with a retro board, it takes multiple uh, clock cycles just to do one instruction. So it would take forever to get the thing to run if you slow this clock down too much. So I think this is going to be a more reasonable speed. At full speed, ish, not full speed, but at, at you know a respectable, decent speed at 12.5 megahertz, we can just set the number of bits to 1. And then it'll go real fast, okay? So I'll play around with this, throw the scope on there. We'll have some uh, eyeballs at some of the status bits, all right? So that's what's going on here. Uh, every time the clock ticks, add one to the counter. That's all this is going to do. And it'll free run, it'll overflow, go back to zero, and then count back up again and so on. And what we're going to do to generate the external clock speed, I'm going to set... The EXTAL input of the Z8S 180 to equal whatever the most significant bit of the counter is at right now. Because if you think about it, if the counter has, you know, how, no matter how many bits it has, the most significant bit, when it starts out at zero, along with all the other bits, is zero. And the least significant bits are flipping up and down and up and down while it's counting. Da, 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 and all these carries and carries and carries and carries are coming over here. And the most significant bit, you have to count up halfway to the overflow point before the most significant bit ever turns on. And then the second half of all the counting, until it wraps around back to zero, that most significant bit is on the whole time. So therefore, this, as long as I set uh, it to the most significant bit which is however many bits there are minus one, because that's the range of bits that I make this counter variable equal to up here, okay? That's going to be a square wave with a 50-50 duty cycle running at whatever speed you get when you divide 25 million by two to the whatever power this turns out to be. Okie dokie. All right. Now, what else do we got going on here? Now, when we're running super slow... What I want to see are the least significant eight bits of the address bus. They should just start counting one, fetching from two, fetching from three, and so on. Otherwise, if it does that, we know that the chip is working, the power is good. There's, you know, we can also take a look at the uh, uh, signal integrity using oscilloscopes and stuff like that. It's all we really want to get out of this. Now, to make sure it doesn't do anything that we don't want, it's to run off and do anything screwy, we need to shut off every possible feature, interrupts all this other crap. So do not request the bus. Do not request any DMA. Do not assert any interrupts. Note I got three bits of ones in here because this is a three-bit uh, vector. Do not assert the NMI. Do not ask for any wait states. These are not used, but, you know, if, if we had this, uh, the RAM in there, do not enable the RAM, et cetera, et cetera. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So shut off everything. Just let it free run. That's what this program's supposed to do. So let's go ahead and compile it up. Now, if we do this, and it all flies by the screen, I don't know about you, did anybody see any errors or warnings or anything? Something says there's a warning down here, but God knows where it is in here. So here's how I do this while I'm trying to debug my program. I have a make world rule that does a make clean and rebuilds everything from scratch. 
So if I do this, it redirects standard out and standard error into the less command, which allows us to page through all of our output. It'll also let us do text searches in here for things like warning. Now, the way I do this is I skip the first letter because it might be uppercase, might be lowercase. How do I know? And I don't want to type for an hour and a half, typing in a regular expression that covers both. So I just type, we'll search for A-R-N-I-N-G because I've read it a million times and I know that the rest of the warning message is in lowercase like that. Okay, so what does it say? You know, this is limited support for tri-state logic at the moment in consideration for line 68 of top dot V. So there's exactly the message they said we would see. If we look at top dot V and we go to line 68, aha, we find it's trying to set either zeros or Zs. So that's a warning about that. And that's a well-known error, uh, error, a well-known feature of Yosis. So we can kind of look the other way. Oops, I typed a whole word in that time. A-R-N-I-N-G. Let's go back up to the top of the file and search. So there's that one again, right? So what's the other warnings all about in here? Warning the network's combinatorial run. For, I never do this. I think I, I Googled this once. And, and what happens is, is when it's um, developing the, the hardware, when it's inferring the gates that we're supposed to use and so on, uh, if you have an incredibly simplistic design now this is really simple okay uh it it is a little bit too simple and one of these commands like this whatever score is when it goes through a design like that and it comes out and says oh this is there's nothing in here but a combinational circuit it generates this warning over here and i don't honestly know what it means or what we get out of doing this anybody got experience let me know i'll have to dig into this and read up on it at some point but i've seen this a gazillion times and it doesn't seem to be a problem my understanding like i said is that this command if it has nothing to do it generates this warning and it's no big deal uh, what else do we got so this tells us that there was a warning the score warning during the uh this pass of the building of the code. And then down here, there's a, what is this? Unmatched constraint for S2N. That means that there's an S2N on line 73 in the PCF file that is not in my top module, which is the, the one I deleted <laughs> along with all the redundant stuff that I can't believe has been in there. Sorry about that. So what else is it gonna warn? It, down here, it'll say there's one warning during this, uh, while it was mapping the pins. This is the, 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 the place and route. Because remember, when we compile this program, it does two things. It runs Yosis to build it. It's sort of like compiling a program. It compiles it into assembler. Then the assembler runs, and it makes it into a binary. So in Yosis is like the compiler, which says, here's what gates you need. And then pl uh, place and route, which would be uh, the, the next PNR in here somewhere. We should see net next PNR start running, uh, which is the, the fa second phase. It's like the assembler. I don't know. If we scroll through here, actually, this might be part of next PNR. In fact, if we choose, uh, search for PNR, there's where it starts right there. Okay. So, yeah, it's right after what we were just looking at. So up here is the Yosis, and it says, oh, by the way, here's a summary of all the stuff that I decided I want to do. And you can kind of get a feel for how complicated this is. I got 31 LUT4s in here. Uh, some of them are flip-flops. There's how many carries there are, and I've talked about this before. The carry chain is a super critical thing, usually, in most circuits that dictates how slow it's going to be. So that's a very deeply concerning thing when it comes to performance. So that's why you get statistics on it. Uh, that's before it even routes it. And then after the routing is all done, which is why we care about the pins and stuff like that, it gives you, here's exactly what it is, because the place and route can actually remove redundant things. So now notice we only are going to use, what do we got here? Uh, 22 of them are, are uh, D flip-flops. Nine of them are just used for LUTs. This is, that means there's nine of them involved in combinational circuits. 22 involved in circuits that have a latch. 
a D flip-flop. Uh, those are the bits that are in my counter because obviously a counter has to have state. Uh, what do we got? We wasted an entire, uh, what is it, LC? Uh, logic block used as carry only. It may be that they um, remember that there's like LUTs and then there's a set of LUTs as in a block and then there's a set of blocks and so on. The... Uh, the carry has to run through multiple blocks, so it may be this may be talking about how the carry goes from one to another. I guess I'm no, I don't know every single thing about all these warnings, but we would expect to see things like that to legalize carry change. I don't know what that literally means, but I do know that we have a a counter with 22 bits in it, so one would expect that the clock is connected up to 22 latches to make my counter. So all this makes sense. Now in the end, we're using 35 out of 7680 uh, LUTs. We're not using any RAMs, and we're uh, using 7080 I.O. pins out of the 100 and some odd, and, and so on and so on and so on, right? Okay, so I don't see any real problems, and it doesn't say that there's any real errors. Down here, it gives you a detailed description of the longest path through your design. And it says, oh, this is because the hardware clock, as it goes into this clock thing here on this, uh, what is it, pause edge to pause edge, how long will it take the entire circuit to react and become stable between two rising edges of the main clock? This is the critical thing about the performance of our entire design. So after all this, this is going to be your carry chain of the counter. It will say it takes 3.7 nanoseconds at least to update the counter between two clocks. Therefore, the maximum speed you can ever run down here it gives you yada yada yada. It could run as fast as 204.33 megahertz, which is good enough for us. <laughs> because I asked it, if we look in the make file, I asked it, I said, look, I, I've got a 25 megahertz clock. And when you when you calculate all this, make sure that it can uh, you know, nothing will take longer than the period of a 25 megahertz clock <laughs> it says you're good <laughs> a little bit of elbow room okay okay and these are some statistics and diagnostics of the program as it runs okay so uh we've seen this before i can take make prog and this will program the uh the flash rom on the fpga board and when this is done we can reset it and see if it is counting the way we want it to All right, so here is me uh, resetting the uh, the board. And now keep in mind, this clock is running insanely slow. It's even, uh, what is it, divided by the 22-bit value, which is uh, probably running at like, I don't know, like 12 or 16 hertz, right? And that, remember, is divided by 2 before it comes up with the phi clock that the main processor even uses for its timing. And if you read the spec, you know that the reset signal has to be asserted for like many, many cycles before the Z80 is fully reset inside there, which is why I'm holding this thing down for so long. Now, while I'm holding it down, you can see that the address uh, lines are all high. They're floating and they're pulled up. So it makes sense that they would all be ones. And I rigged up the A um, bits through the FPGA to these uh, LEDs. So that is all high. When I release this, we should see it start counting as it fetches from address zero and one and so on. That's definitely zero. And there's your one, two. Okay, so this is very promising. Uh, there's your three. Uh, there's your four. Why is there a two? And there's your five. And then there's a six, and uh, there's an eight, there's uh, there's nine. So it's doing something else in there. Now, this threw me for a loop when I was trying to debug this. Let's see who can guess what it's doing. <laughs> it took me about five minutes to come up with the end. I was like, what the heck is going on? Made me a little nervous. Let's hook up the probe here. 
easy into the clip there. Let me see and turn it around the other way and hold better. So now remember, I, I pinned things through to this bottom connector here so that I can hook my probe onto something. I probably should have used longer pin, you know, a socket with these big long pins. But those sockets are, are like eight times more expensive than the one that I just hacked in half and stuck in here. And this is a quick hack board to just try and test what happens when all this stuff goes together uh, so that I don't have to waste too much time assembling if I have to throw this away and start over. I can just take another board on there. So anyway, um, point is I want to use a cheap connector. So I run these through here down to here. And this one here should be the... Uh, external crystal signal running and that should be going at a couple of hertz now if i go over to my trusty scope here i'm gonna have to oh man this is so slow there we go let me get a cursor on the screen wow this it, every time the scope triggers it takes a long time to get a waveform save it's very funny then I want to move this other cursor over here. What's the period of this thing? So it takes 168 milliseconds just for one clock cycle. It's running at 5.9. It's running at about 6 hertz. So that's a very slow main system clock, all right? Now the next pin down is phi. If we put a clip on there... We zoom out a little bit further on the ye olde scope. Now we can see that the phi signal is generated by toggling the output on the falling edge of the external crystal input signal. And that's running at half the 6 hertz. So now we're down to 3 hertz. So the main clock of the Z80 is running at 3 hertz. So if we put the trigger of the scope onto phi instead of the external clock, because the external clock is really not that interesting to us because the Z80 internally is all about the phi signal. So let's move our trigger onto phi. So the good news is that A, I can generate a clock and it can go into the Z80. Z80 is doing something, although it's not doing what I thought it would do. It's counting in a weird order. Uh, the next pin over, I believe, is M1. Actually, let's put the scope trigger on M1. Now I can see it's inconsistent. Sometimes... We see M1 followed by a long pause. Other time we see an M1 followed by a short pause. But if we put the next probe on the next pin here, this is the memory request. Now, if we look at the uh, the the M1 in yellow, and then we look at the M rec, that's the the memory bus request, right? Because it wants to do an I/O operation. We see it go low on the purple line. So when it's talking to what would be the SRAM, it goes low and stays low for a long time. Then it goes low again, as you can see here in the middle of the uh, scope picture here uh, mystery access and then it goes low again for an m1 cycle on the right side of the scope so what took me a little while to figure out what the heck was going on was the the um the cpu is doing a refresh cycle <laughs> because that's what the z80 does uh, at the end of the m1 cycle so we can get rid of that on the s180 by simply disabling it. There's a way to do that and say, don't do this and don't waste so much time. Then uh, I sat there scratching my head, why the heck M1 lasts so long? Well, M1 lasts a long time because if you dig through the manual, you'll see that by default, the Z8 S180 does you the kind favor of uh, uh, turning on three wait states for every single uh, memory I.O. access. And <laughs> we don't want that either. So we can actually disable these things if we want to. So 
why is the address counting wonky? The address is counting wonky because it is fetching the bytes one after another in order, but between fetching the bytes, it does a, a refresh access cycle, which means there's another counter running, which is the refresh address that goes out on the address bus between instructions. So that's why if you watch this and you back up the video or whatever and pause and, and single step through it, you can count see it counting the addresses to execute the no-ops from zero up, and you can also see it counting from zero up doing the refreshes interleave back and forth. But not every instruction has a refresh because the refreshes are done based on the kind of a wall clock period. So some instructions have them and some don't. So out of the gate, the Z8S180 interleaves back and forth. It'll jitter a lot. It'll have inconsistent execution times in order to work in these refresh cycles. The big takeaway here is it works <laughs> so ne next time we will look at the uh, the loop example and then we'll look at the uh, program example down here we actually load in and run uh code from the z80 assembler well thanks for watching i'll see you next time <laughs>